good to have everybody here. Um, and it's nice to be at the Rochester Hills Public Library. We're just down the road, of course, at Oakland University, but I haven't been in this building before, and it's, it's good to be here. Um, I'm also not used to holding a mic, so um, you know, we'll, we'll see how that, how that goes. Um, but uh, I, I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about the book, but also a little bit about how historians think, how we do our research, how discoveries come to be. And you know, Teresa tipped you off a little bit about how this all started. Um, but um, you know, the project itself began about 20 years ago, really, quite honestly. It takes a long time to get a book out. Um, but uh, I had gotten this job at Oakland University, and I was casting about for a, a new research project. I had. Um, published a book on um, cotton mill workers in North Carolina. I was a graduate student at Duke, uh, and I worked on that project. And uh, now I was back in Michigan. I was born in Michigan, but was back in the state uh, for a job. And I was trying to think of what I could do. Uh, um, with the uh, cotton mill workers, I had started out doing oral history, interviewing people about the past, and had found a treasure trove of documents in the basement of a cotton mill, and had kind of converted that into a, a, a book. The mill uh, documents helped me put in context the, the, the interview material I was coming up with. And so um, uh, I started looking at the, the literature. You're kind of identified by your research topic as a historian. So I was suddenly a labor historian. I didn't know I was going to be that when I went to graduate school. But because I looked at cotton mill workers and their um, experiences with a union in North Carolina, then I became a labor historian. So I had to do something in, in, in labor history, I guess, to, to justify my, my hire. And um, you know, I, I, Detroit, when you think of Detroit, you think of auto workers and the auto industry, of course. And so I started doing what historians do. We start reading the literature and uh, try to see what's been written. What have, what have historians said? What have scholars said about auto workers and, um, and the auto industry? Um, and what I found was that there was a lot written about Walter Ruther, the longtime president of the United Auto Workers. Uh, there was an awful lot written about top UAW policy, especially with regard to communists in the union and pol politics and political uh, uh, positions held by uh, top UAW leaders. Um, but I found that auto workers themselves were usually absent from the literature. There wasn't really anything about auto workers themselves. I thought that was pretty interesting, an interesting omission, given how many auto workers there must have been um, in this region. Um, and I also was interested that the lack of any research on auto workers didn't prevent people from having very solidly held beliefs about auto workers. Okay. Um, and, um, some of you probably are familiar with some of the ideas that were out there in the literature. They're still with us today, and they're, they're debated heavily right now, or at least uh, assumed heavily. And one is that, uh, as Teresa mentioned, that it was seen as a golden age for auto workers these years after World War II. The post-war boom had arrived. There was pent-up demand for automobiles. Uh, Walter Ruther was very successful at negotiating contracts, union contracts, that included wage increases and benefit increases and all these sorts of things. And so um, uh, this was a time, uh, everyone argued, uh, that auto workers could enter the middle class, that they could uh, uh, show up at a plant gate uh, with barely a high school education, maybe even without one, and lie a little bit, and be assured of a lifetime of, of full employment, steady employment. And, uh, um, and, and that's still you know, very commonly uh, uh, held to be the case. Um, and so um, there were some other things in literature. I'm, I'm going to, you know, risk a little bit of uh, um, historiography on you, the history of the history of the subject, and so you can understand more about what I was seeing when I was starting the project. Um, there were some books out there that uh, emphasized the militancy of, of workers, their activism in this period. But the activism tended to be by white workers trying to make sure that black workers didn't move into their neighborhoods or into their jobs. It tended to be more along racial lines and not the kind of activism that labor historians set out to hope to find you know, in, in this period, you know, uh, workers trying to assert themselves in, in the workplace. Um, and in the literature on the 1950s, the auto workers, again, there's not much on them directly, but to the extent that they appear, uh, they're seen as kind of disengaged from the union leadership. There's a gulf developing in this period, and the argument was always that um, they were just getting satisfied because of their high wages, uh, because of their um, lavish benefits. And also, um, there was the truth that the workers in the 50s generally weren't the same workers in the 1930s who had engaged in sit-down strikes and uh, union organizing campaigns. And so many of these workers in the 1950s didn't have that as a touchstone, and it made a lot of the older auto workers kind of angry. You don't understand all that we went through. You don't understand how you got what, what we have today. Um, also, um, you know, 
labor historians tended to be kind of a, a hopeful lot, wanting uh, um, auto workers again to rise up and do whatever they were supposed to do. But in the post-World War II period, most of these union contracts mandated that problems in the plants would be resolved through grievance procedures. If you don't like what happened, then you file a grievance. It goes to the first step, it goes to the second step, goes to the third step, and it might go to arbitration. And these are slow, cumbersome processes, uh, but you know, labor historians were kind of disappointed, if you, if you could get the drift of it, that these workers hadn't taken things into their own hands. Why had they uh, succumbed to these, uh, the, the, these grievance procedures? Um, there's a book by Tom Seguru, Origins of the Urban Crisis, which is about the decline of Detroit, and it's a really central book in this, uh, in this period. And he argued that a lot of African American workers lost their jobs in the 1950s, uh, largely because of automation, uh, you know, the technologically driven advances in the workplace that got rid of a lot of jobs. And a lot of the jobs that were lost in the 1950s were materials handling jobs, jobs where you would move you know, materials, you know, parts from one machine to the next, a lot of really hard, heavy labor jobs that have been reserved for African Americans. But in order to streamline the production process, a lot of the automation goals were aimed at trying to, to reduce those bottlenecks, and African Americans lost a lot of jobs. And also, um, a lot of African Americans lost their jobs because of the decentralization of auto uh, production away from Detroit. Uh, by the mid-1950s, uh, only about 30 to 35 percent of cars nationwide were assembled. In, uh, in, in the Detroit area, you know, down from a, a much higher percentage earlier. And, and auto plants were moving out of the Detroit to where the population was growing, in California, uh, in the southwest, um, the east coast, uh, you know, away from uh, the Midwest. It made sense business-wise to build clo uh, cars closer to where the, 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 the customers were. But for the, from the vantage point of African Americans in Detroit, as plants moved away from Detroit, even just as far as Livonia or Warren, it made those jobs largely inaccessible. Um, so that's a big part of the literature I was looking at, too. Um, there's a book by Nancy Gaben about women auto workers and women's experiences in the UAW. And um, as you might imagine, they encountered uh, a lot of roadblocks in, in gaining access to jobs and a lot of sexual harassment while in the job uh, or on the job, and a lot of resistance from largely male union leaders about addressing their concerns about uh, safety on the job, about promotions, about uh, um, equal pay for equal work, and all these sorts of things. So um, um, the, the points I just mentioned, if you can hear, kind of work against that notion of it being a golden age that there were you know, a lot of people for whom maybe it wasn't such a, a golden era. You know, um, if you weren't able to keep your job in the auto industry, if you were blocked from having a job um, in the first place. Um, I'll get to it a little bit later in the talk, but some of you also realize that um, uh, a lot of the independent automakers, Hudson, you know, uh, Nash, uh, um, uh, you know, Packard, uh, mostly Packard and, 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 and Hudson, um, uh, you know, they d disappeared from Detroit completely in the 1950s, and the, the east side of Detroit suffered tremendously as a result. And, and historians kind of tell you that, but then they just resume and say, oh, it was the golden age. But, you know, there were, you know, 100,000 jobs lost or so, you know, during this period. And so um, what happened to them, right? Uh, and that's one of the things that I was kind of curious about, uh, what, what, what's going on here. Um, so um, again, that's kind of where things stood um, and where things stand now in that, um, if anything, our sense of auto workers has returned to the golden age uh, uh, thesis in full force. Leading uh, labor historians argue this, leading business historians argue this, leading journalists in their books, and you tend to argue this, it becomes a, a staple of, of American history, but it's rooted right here in, in Southeast Michigan. And so, um, uh, you know, some of these works that I'm talking about actually came out after I started the project. It took me so long to finish, uh, but, um, you know, the overarching narrative really hadn't changed much. Um, so then I, I, you know, I decided I would launch an oral history project. Let's, let's find out how these auto workers dealt with prosperity. Let's see what they did. That's what I, my assumption was heading in, at least if, uh, to the extent that I interviewed white workers, if I interviewed African American workers they probably were going to be people who had managed to keep their jobs over the years because I located most of these interviewees at UAW retiree luncheons, okay? If you think about it, I'm launching an oral history project. Uh, uh, well, you know, uh, if it's about the late 1940s and on through the 1950s, well, you know, who are these people and where are they? Um, you know, there were upwards of at least 500,000 auto workers in Detroit at the peak moments of employment in the 1950s, but where were they in the early 2000s? Some were no longer alive. Uh, somewhere in Arizona and Florida, you know, uh, Las Vegas. Uh, um, but there were still probably tens of thousands in the metro Detroit area. But how do you find them? 
Okay. Um, and so um, I, you know, a running partner of mine was a, an engineer at the Ford Ypsilanti plant. Um, and he said, hey, you know, we have a retiree chapter. Let me link you up with uh, the retiree chapter president. And I did that. And uh, um, uh, uh, the retiree chapter president was very interested in this project um, and um, helped me organize some interviews. Let me use his office. Uh, to do the interviews. And a student of mine at Oakland uh, was involved with Local 653, which used to be the Pontiac Motor Local. And he did the same for me there, linking me up with the retiree chapter president. Without those kinds of connections, without the willing participation and very skilled participation of those retiree chapter presidents, this never probably would have happened. Um, and, and so, you know, historians are always grateful for people who help them along the way. Usually they're archivists in big libraries and all, but in this case it was, you know, people who could connect me uh, and, and support me in, in this venture. Um, so if I interviewed these people in the early 2000s, by definition they were on the younger side in the 1950s, right? Um, and so automatically that would possibly skew the results, you know, talking to people who were younger, uh, would their experiences be different? from those who were older you know, in, in that decade. So I always had to be attentive to that. Um, after about 40 of these interviews, okay, um, my head was a jumble because when you're interviewing people, you're trying to think of the next question to ask, you're trying to process what you're hearing and you don't really fully understand what you've gotten until you go back and transcribe the interviews. Have any of you ever transcribed conversations? And how easy was it? Not easy, yeah, right. You know, uh, you know it can take six or seven, eight hours of, 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 of transcribing time per hour of, of conversation. And even then, you're not sure you have it right. But as I was going through, and I had some help from a former student, but as we were going through, um, one thing I noticed is what Teresa said. It's like, wait a minute. These people weren't just steadily auto, auto workers throughout this decade. Uh, they're in and out of auto work all the time, you know, sometimes of their own choosing but sometimes not of their own choosing. And uh, one of the things I realized is that in the interview pool I had, these people were trying to be auto workers throughout the 1950s, but they were only successful at being auto workers about half the decade, about half the time. Okay, and so, like, what's up with that? You know, uh, um, you know what, what, what is going on? Because with interviews, you find out a lot about the personal experiences uh, of the people you're talking to, but maybe not as much about larger forces that might be at work, that might be causing uh, th these, these layoffs, okay? Um, all of the people I talked with, I realized as going, you know, went through the interviews, had secondary support networks. When they were laid off, occasionally they would claim unemployment benefits, but unemployment benefits were really meager in this decade. They didn't come anywhere near replacing your take-home pay. And especially if you had kids, uh, uh, you know, um, you weren't going to be able to survive on, on unemployment benefits. And everybody had some kind of a, a, a support network. And um, I'm going to use my notes carefully here because I compiled a partial list of the jobs that auto workers had in the 1950s, okay? Um, just based on some of my interviews. And there were more that I didn't include. But they included trailer home washer, cab driver, department store clerk, bank employee, telephone pole installer, promotional event searchlight operator, feed store worker, cyclone fence installer, uh, moving company worker, University of Michigan law club janitor, junior high cafeteria worker, insurance repair construction worker, winery employee, trash hauler, chicken farmer, wallpaperer, army surplus store employee, barber, berry picker, cotton picker, golf caddy, and soldier. Okay. Um, uh, it's like, hmm, uh, you know, if you are a caddy or, uh, uh, you know, if you're uh, working in a junior high cafeteria, are you an auto worker? You might want to be an auto worker. <laughs> you might be hoping you get called back to the plant, but it was kind of hard to figure out exactly who these people were and, and, and what they were doing. And just as a side note, the woman who was the junior high cafeteria worker had a husband who did not want her to work outside the home at all, especially not in an auto plant because it was a foul place where the men used bad language and it was dirty. Uh, and, and she got laid off and she's the one who had to take this job in the junior high cafeteria. And she said she had never heard such foul language as she had at the junior high cafeteria. <laughs> that, that, that was by far a more dangerous and awful place to be, okay? Uh, so you, you just never know, all right? Um, uh, but anyways, uh, you know, what I was processing here was, you know, again, what this whole thing of auto worker meant at all, because we were taught that you showed up at the plant gate, you had your lifetime of, se of secure employment. 
Hmm, okay. So then the, the historian's minds are turning. It's like, well, did I find the 40 outliers? Did I find the few incompetent cranks who simply couldn't survive, you know, in, in this era of plenty and abundance? You know, why, why was it that, that, that they weren't able to secure um, steady employment? Again, I wasn't sure that was the case, but that's a question you ask. Like, is this representative, right? Um, you know, can I, can I trust the evidence? Um, and so then um, I thought, well, I have to do something. Um, I could do a whole lot more interviews, okay. And I don't know if there are any people with um, social science backgrounds out there or statistics backgrounds, but you know, if there were as many as 500,000 auto, auto workers at some point in time, and I had talked to 45 or so, that's a pretty small sample, right? And if I had talked to 1,000, it would still be a really small sample, wouldn't it? <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, and, and so um, uh, if you've ever done oral history, you will know that if you set out to do 1,000 interviews, uh, you would never survive, you know, the completion of the book you know, by the time you did them and transcribed them unless you had an army of people involved, okay? And so I'm thinking, well, I would like to finish this someday. Uh, is there any other way that I can try to corroborate or contradict the, the, the oral history evidence, okay? And so um, what I decided to do was kind of go old school. I decided I would read local newspapers. I'd read the Detroit Free Press, read the Detroit News. I read the Michigan Chronicle, the African American Detroit Weekly, okay? And I read them through, and I, what I was looking for is whether or not I would see a story of prosperity and job security, or if there would be some story of insecurity, okay? Or something else completely different. I did, didn't know, okay? Um, and, you know, I thought, I, you know, this, is, this will take a couple months. We'll see what happens, okay? Uh, and I went and I started reading uh, the Detroit Free Press on microfilm at the University of Michigan Grad Library. I happened to live in Ann Arbor, so I would take the bus down there and read microfilm for hours on end. Um, and if you've ever done that, it's sort of a form of torture. Uh, you know, you're looking at the screen, it's a little bit blurry, um, nothing's digitized in, in this era, um, you know, nothing is indexed, so my eyeballs were the Google algorithm, you know, just kind of flipping the pages by with the, 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 the controller, and you're looking to see if there's anything on the page that looks like it might have something to do with auto workers, and every issue of the paper had a lot to do with the auto industry or auto workers. There was so, so much stuff, it took like five years. Not steadily, I had to teach, okay? But uh, um, uh, you know, it took a long time to get through the microfilm. After about four hours, I would look like I was on some form of drug, and, and I would kind of stagger home and uh, you know, live to see the next day, right? Um, but anyways, um, what I found was that the newspaper evidence completely supported, actually enhanced the notion that this was an unstable, insecure era for auto workers. It was quite clear, very obvious from reading the newspapers, that maybe there were two or three economists working for the Detroit Board of Commerce, but nobody else who actually thought that auto work was stable and secure. No one at the time thought that. Not, uh, uh, not automakers, not the, you know, the heads of, of, the, of the Detroit Three, not uh, Walter Ruther and the leadership of the UAW, not the workers themselves, not the mayor or business leaders around town. Everybody knew that auto work was unstable, insecure, um, and then I'm thinking, okay, why do we think the opposite today, right? You know, what, what, how did that come to be? That's a small part of, of, of my book. But um, what I learned is that there were three periods in the 1950s, really the period 1945 to 1950, when there was anything resembling a post-war boom. Uh, one was in early 1950, one was in 1953, and maybe the first half of 1955. There were sustained uh, um, bursts of, of, of employment, some exceptions, but um, those would be the periods that come closest to the notion that there was some kind of uh, you know, secure, uh, lucrative employment to be had in, in the auto industry. Um, the biggest year of employment increase was 1953. That happened to be when a lot of the people I interviewed had joined the auto industry. I didn't know why when I was talking to them. You know, well, how come you all started work in 53? But you know, I'll, I'll get into that in a second. That was a, a period of, of, of big expansion. Um, and um, coupled with the truth that there was a huge churn in auto workers and relatively few of the auto workers in the 50s had been auto workers in the 30s, I began to think that maybe my interview sampling was a bit more representative than I had ever thought in the first place. They were really representative of this new wave, you know, not in a, a, a sense that would satisfy statisticians, but maybe in a more qualitative sense that would satisfy historians, we'll see. Um, but anyways, um, excuse me. My thesis is that um, this period that has been held to be the post-war boom, 
wasn't for auto workers. Uh, it was true that most of the auto companies were profitable throughout all these years. There are some exceptions with Chrysler. They had some years that weren't very good at all. Uh, but um, you know, for the most part, auto companies made a lot of money. And certainly there was a national post-war boom. Almost all of the macroeconomic data would lead you to believe that there had to be a boom for auto workers. If you looked at their contracts, as I'll get to, you couldn't help but believe that there was a post-war boom. But I'm arguing that there was a huge discrepancy between this data, these, these bigger indicators, ma macroeconomic indicators, and how auto workers actually lived their lives. Um, conditions were worse for African Americans and white women. There were hardly any African American women hired in the auto industry in these years. But conditions were definitely worse for African American men and, and, and white women. But they weren't really good for anybody. <laughs> OK. Uh, and so, you know, that's a distinction that wasn't in the literature uh, before. Um, I'm going to spend a little time um, talking with you about, uh, uh, or to you, I guess, about, you know, what I found. Um, some terminology and other methodological things first. Um, um, you know, the book is, relies heavily on unemployment figures compiled by the uh, Michigan State Department of Labor and, and, and local, um, uh, um, you know, organizations, agencies. Um, but it was really hard to tell what to make of them uh, because um, uh, even those who compiled the uh, unemployment data realized that it was kind of hard to, to have a firm handle on it because there were so many auto-related workplaces, each with fluctuating employment totals almost every day. And what they did is they had a few uh, companies that checked in regularly with their employment totals and they kind of extrapolated out and tried to figure out what uh, unemployment was um, you know, on a monthly basis. But I did think that the, the unemployment data helped establish general trends. Uh, you could get a sense for whether things were going up, whether things were going down. But um, they're not as precise as they would lead you to believe. And at one point, um, the people who put out the st statistics said, um, we really don't know what happened to 30,000 people. We, 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 we haven't a clue. Because there were no turnstiles at the, you know, at the city limits or anything like that to figure out who was coming in, who was, who was leaving. Um, also, to be officially employed, you had to work all of one hour a week. Okay, so if you see the, uh, uh, you know, the unemployed total, well, if you worked one, two, or three hours a week, you're not in that category, you're employed. Okay, but um, you know, if you were working even 10 or 15 hours a week, you might as well have been unemployed, you're making less than you would through unemployment benefits. Okay, so you know, that became an issue throughout this, this time as well. Um, it was also really difficult to figure out how much workers earned. You could look at the contracts and you could see what they were supposed to get per hour, but historians and you know, economists in the 1950s have all been guilty of just kind of doing the arithmetic. You made this much per hour, 40 hours a week, 50 or so weeks a year, we know how much you made because you had steady employment, right? Um, but the layoffs just completely undercut that as any reasonable way or realistic way of calculating how much people um, were earning because you know, you, hourly wages meant nothing you know, if you were unemployed. Um, Throughout most of the era under consideration in my book, uh, Chrysler was by far Detroit's largest employer. Okay, um, uh, they had, uh, or Ford was close behind, I guess. It wasn't really by far. Ford was often, you know, close behind. Um, but they had between 70,000 and 130,000 employees each throughout this period, fluctuating depending on, um, you know, where it was in the decade, uh, how the economy was doing. Um, the peak employment for all of the companies in Detroit was 1955. That was the, the biggest boom year of all. Um, in contrast, General Motors had a rel relatively small presence in Detroit until the very late 1950s. They only had about 30 or 40,000 workers in Detroit. They were heavily uh, located in, in uh, Lansing, in Flint, and in Pontiac uh, uh, down the road here. And so uh, the fortunes of GM had less to do with Detroit auto workers than uh, um, these other companies. And as I mentioned before, you know, Hudson, Packard, Kaiser, Fraser, the independent automakers were a huge presence in Detroit. Combined, uh, um, at the start of my uh, uh, study, they had about 70,000 employees, and that's more than double what GM had in this period. So we don't really think of them as major players because they disappeared, but in terms of how auto workers experienced in the 1950s, the loss of those three independents and their production was more serious than any problems happening with, uh, with, with, with GM. Um, all right, now uh, into some of the actual stuff. Um, in the immediate post-World War II period, um, uh, 
you know, books emphasize that reconversion from military production to civilian production was handled pretty quickly. There weren't the massive layoffs and, and strikes as there had been after World War I, or so the story went. Um, but I found that the reconversion took a lot longer in practice than historians had thought. It was true the auto industry could get new tools and dyes in place, they could have the machinery in place to produce cars, but they couldn't get the metals and other materials. All right? um, as you read through the papers, you realize that material shortages were just the bane of automakers' existence, hence they were the bane of auto workers' existence, because if the automakers couldn't make cars, the auto workers aren't at work. Um, but um, steel was uh, in great demand. There was a national post-war boom, but if we stop to think of all the things that steel went into, we can start to realize why it may, might have been hard to get the share of that steel supply that you wanted. Uh, steel was used for train cars, which were essential for building the economy. Uh, construction, home and business construction, home appliances, uh, all the stoves and refrigerators that are a hallmark of the post-war era, they all needed steel. Um, oil refineries, no, no use in building more cars and selling them, but there's not any gasoline, right, to, uh, uh, to fuel them. Uh, oil pipelines, even new steel mills, if you want to boost production, they needed steel. And the Cold War needed steel you know, to, to build up the military. And uh, the government rationed steel to a large extent after the end of World War II, and the auto industry was low on their priority list. Okay? And so there was a time when uh, I, I, think it, uh, um, I think it was Henry Ford II who was hoping that uh, um, the auto industry would produce like five million cars in 1946 or 1947. And you know, after like eight months, they had produced about you know, what, you know, um, 100,000 or something, you know, and, and it's just like, whoa, you know, uh, um, you know what, what's the problem here, okay? Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, and it wasn't uh, um, workers ornering us, it was the lack of, uh, of access to these supplies. Um, there were also problems with strikes. A lot of the shortages ended up being because of strikes. A lot of uh, industrial workers all around the country, steel workers, coal workers, glass workers, copper workers, they felt really burdened by inflation. Uh, pent up uh, uh, um, uh, um, wage stagnation during World War II and then post-war inflation, they thought they were falling behind and there would be industry-wide strikes. Start thinking about it. If the coal industry goes on strike, how much steel is being produced? You know, you can't make steel without coal. Um, if the copper industry goes out on strike, well, it turns out there's a lot of copper in a car. You know, radiators, all the electrical wiring, um, and so you'd have to shut down production. Um, uh, I'll give you an example in a, in, a, in a second. Maybe I'll do it right now. But um, uh, first of all, I'm just saying that these were chronic in the early post-war years. There seemed to always be a steel strike, always a coal strike. If the railroad workers went on strike, you don't get any supplies in, can't get your cars out. And, and everyone's frustrated, okay? And nationally, there's a sense of these workers just going crazy. They're going nuts. What's the problem with these workers? Well, they had their own good reasons individually, but the, the economy was so interconnected that if you were a steel worker and went on strike, you weren't just affecting the steel industry, you're affecting everything you know, around the country. Um, one of the biggest examples in the literature of uh, a strike in this early post-war year is a, one of General Motors, 1945 and 1946. Um, it's a, a famous strike because Walter Ruther demanded a 30% increase in wages for auto workers, but he also demanded that there be no increase in the price of cars. And he said if GM claimed that they couldn't do that, he said they'd have to open the books and prove it. Okay, show us that you can't do that. Okay, well GM said, mm -mm. okay. Uh, and then he said, you know, we're a publicly traded company. If you want to see our books, become a stockholder and you can get whatever information you get at the stockholders meeting, right? Um, but anyways, the strike went on for 113 days. And labor historians have debated until the cows come home about whether Ruther was militant and radical or not whether his tactics were sound. They ended up settling for far less than 30% uh, wage increases, and they had no control ultimately over the price of cars. Um, and you know, that's how the whole thing has been debated. But when I was looking at this, I was saying, hey, how did those workers survive 113 days without paychecks? Okay, And all of a sudden in the paper, uh, um, you're seeing that people are desperate. Okay, uh, uh, you know, They're uh, trying to rely on their secondary support networks but um, a lot of workers were trying to engage in those secondary support networks, and it turns out that throughout the whole period, the whole 113 days, there was a glass workers strike, okay? There were no cars being produced in Detroit because of the glass workers strike. So from GM's perspective, why settle? You can't produce cars anyway. When they're on strike, then they don't get unemployment. 
It's up to the union to support them. And the union had zero in their strike fund. Okay. And so, uh, again, people had missed that, and I wouldn't blame them because why would you go looking for that? Was there a glass workers strike? You know, but, uh, um, but there was. And so um, uh, the point I'm getting at is that um, from a worker's perspective, these were times of great hardship right on the heels of World War II. Okay? Um, people were you know, potentially going to be evicted from their apartments, you know, losing their, their homes. Uh, if they had cars, they weren't keeping up with car payments. All right? Um, so that was an authorized strike. That was an official one called by the union for a specific purpose. But it turns out there are a whole lot of unauthorized wildcat strikes in the auto industry as well in this period. Anytime workers were upset, they could do what they were supposed to do and file a formal grievance and have it heard and wait for the outcome, which could take months, okay. Or they could just say, forget it. We're just not working. We're walking out. And a whole lot of workers did that. It bedeviled Walter Ruther and top UAW leadership because their claim was that we can regularize employment and, uh, and solve our disputes and maintain production, but the workers were defying them uh, on many occasions. Um, the problems were big, they were small, they were everything. Uh, some workers went on a wildcat strike because the bathroom door stalls were removed and they thought that, that their dignity was being impaired, you know, um, but the company thought they were wasting their time you know, uh, when they should be at, at work. Uh, sometimes it was just disputes, just you know, uh, uh, um, uh, um, personality differences, these sorts of things, whatever. But the point I'm getting at is that if there's a wildcat strike anywhere in the supply chain, then all of a sudden there are layoffs coming into that bottleneck and leaving it. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and there were um, thousands of parts in every car, and, and you know, lots of places where any kind of wildcat strike could cause a monkey wrench that would ultimately cause an assembly plant to shut down, cause every other uh, 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 production process leading up to that point to, to shut down. Um, you know, that was true um, with a famous Kelsey, Kelsey Hayes strike uh, shortly after World War II as well, um, when um, you know, they made seat frames and they uh, went on strike, the workers did, because they thought that some of their members had been unfairly fired. Well, they were standing on principle, but they also were the supplier to the Ford Rouge plant. And so 50,000 Ford Rouge employees were laid off because Kelsey, Stryker, or Kelsey Hay Strikers uh, decided to, uh, um, uh, to hold off uh, the job. And again, if you start to put it all together, it's like, well, what do those 50,000 workers do? How do they feel about it? I couldn't go back and interview all of them and try to figure out what they thought about it. They might not be able to remember it. You know? But on the other hand, if you start to think about it, we're talking about uh, uh, disruption. We're, we're talking about instability. Uh, for a whole host of, of reasons. Another reason that came up quite frequently was weather. It was too hot in an auto plant. Sometimes workers just said, forget it, we're leaving, we're walking out. Okay, there's no air conditioning in these plants. Detroit summers can be muggy. Um, there was one night when over 200,000 people, many of them auto workers, camped out on Belle Isle because it was just so hot. Okay, uh, you know, <laughs> these are things that I hadn't ever considered before. But likewise, if it was too cold. Um, you know, the plants might shut down. There were a couple cold snaps in the late 40s um, that were really cold, and there was only one gas supply pipeline up from Texas and Oklahoma to, that supplied all of Michigan, Ohio, uh, western Pennsylvania, some of Indiana, and they had to decide, well, who gets gas and who doesn't? A lot of people still heated their homes with coal, but all the plants were shut down for three weeks because of the cold snap, okay? And we're saying, okay, big deal. But if you've lost three weeks of your income throughout the year at that point, that's a lot, and it would put people in a real hole, especially if you're trying to keep up with, with payments. Um, military service interrupted employment for an awful lot of workers. You know, it's not a strike, it's not a supply chain issue, but the draft was in effect, and uh, most male workers uh, would, would spend time in the military. Some of them enlisted to try to get out of the way so that it wouldn't interfere with their careers later, their marriages or attempts to become skilled workers or something. But others finally got their first job and then whoosh, they're off to Korea. We got their first job, whoosh, they're off to, to, uh, um, to Germany or something you know, uh, to uh, put in their time. Um, there was a, a series of contracts in 1950. Um, the one with GM was called the Treaty of Detroit by Fortune magazine and it's really famous in our sense of the 1950s because um, it was one that provided for huge wage increases, cost of living allowances that uh, uh, um, uh, accounted for inflation, okay? The argument was that auto wages weren't causing inflation, auto workers were the victims of inflation, so if inflation went up, they would get automatic wage increases. Um, they got wage increases to account for technological gains, called the annual improvement factor. They got pensions. 
uh, improved health insurance. Uh, these 1950 contracts were the biggest reason why people argued that auto workers were the elite, that this was the golden age, that they finally had entered the middle class. They had all these accoutrements, you know, steady incomes, uh, you know, benefits, um, all these things that have been associated with, uh, with white collar workers. And um, historians have disagreed about whether this was a good thing or a bad thing for workers. You know, was it good that they had the stability, or was it bad that they had this economic uh, security and then they became complacent and weren't militant like good water workers should be or something? You know, um, but no one ever bothered to check to see if that's what happened. Okay? In other words, the contract is there, but is, is that what actually happened? Um, the contracts came on the heels of the 1949 recession. Uh, which was really severe, especially for Chrysler workers in Detroit. If you look at it nationally, it's a blip on the screen, not a big deal. Locally, it was a huge deal. Uh, it it might have been a depression for Chrysler workers. Um, and the 1950 contracts came on the heels as well of a 104-day strike by Chrysler workers um, as they fought for a, a pension. Their workers went out for 104 days. If you think about that, it's almost a third of a year right there without, without a paycheck. And so their workers are already kind of uh, you know, strapped and wondering if they were ever going to regain what they had lost. Um, and, and so um, the 1950 contracts, um, to some extent, were, uh, um, from the automaker's perspective, designed to try to secure wages so they could invest in technology, so they could uh, have some kind of uh, um, clearer sense of what they would have to, uh, to pay out over the years. But then um, the Korean War started, okay, shortly after these contracts were signed. Um, and there was a rush of spending and a rush of purchases of autos uh, uh, right after the Korean War started because of memories of World War II and rationing the possibility that there wouldn't be any more new cars. And so for a little bit, things were looking good. The Treaty of Detroit is signed, production is high, people are buying things, but then um, real rationing did kick in. And once again, to fight the Korean War, the government rationed steel, rationed copper, rationed aluminum, um, and auto workers suffered for the next two years. There wasn't a lot of auto production in Detroit during the Korean War, and to make things worse, Detroit didn't resume its role as the arsenal of democracy. In World War II, eventually defense jobs replaced the civilian auto jobs, but in the Korean War, uh, those defense jobs were going to the big three automakers, but they were placing those jobs in plants in other places around the country. They didn't want to retool, didn't want to eliminate the possibility of, uh, of building cars if this war didn't last very long. So, um, Times were so bad during the Korean War that UAW officials, the leaders or the, the, the CEOs of, of, of the, uh, the big three, and Detroit officials sent out a pamphlet in a huge arc around um, the country from Arkansas and Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia. Um, and it said this, it said, attention would be war workers. Stay away from Detroit unless you have definite promise of a job in this city. If you expect a good paying job in one of the big auto plants at this time, you're doomed to disappointment and hardship. Okay, um, guess how many workers paid attention? <laughs> you know, they remember the arsenal of democracy. It's wartime, times must be good. And we don't know for sure, but it seems as if maybe even 100,000 workers moved to Detroit trying to get jobs, okay? And plus, they had been needed in 1950, just a few months earlier, or about a year earlier, uh, when production was, was, uh, uh, was high, okay? And so um, it turns out that throughout this, the war years, there were at least 100,000 unemployed uh, workers in Detroit, heavily in industry. And at one point, the total reached 250,000. That was in August 1952. That's a lot of auto workers, you know, uh, uh, predominantly auto workers you know, out of jobs. At one point in early 1952, 10% of all the unemployment in the nation was in Detroit. Okay, and so what I'm putting back to you then is that, okay, we've had the Treaty of Detroit signed, which guarantees high wages and benefits and all this, and then we have two and a half years of steady unemployment, okay, you know, capped with uh, um, uh, this dismal uh, 1952, okay. Um, if you start looking at the, the ground floor here, things don't look the same as they do at the level of the, of, of the data. Another thing that really struck me, um, auto workers were, for the most part, unable to buy what they produced throughout this period. We all thought that was saw with Henry Ford and the $5 a day, but um, auto workers could not afford to buy new cars. They could buy used cars, and that's what GM said was right for them, because you had to have a good used car market to bolster the, the, the new car market. Those who could afford to buy new cars wanted to sell their, their, their you know, old models, and they had to have someone to buy them. So uh, the new car sales were aimed at the top 14% of the American population. 
everybody else was considered not to be in the new car market. Yet there was great concern about there not being enough new car sales. And you can start to see the vicious cycle here, okay? So auto workers are saying, well, wait a minute, we could buy new cars if we made more money. And if you're the automaker, if you pay your auto workers more, what happens to the price of the car? <laughs> It goes up, and you're saying, no. And you, you have this, uh, the, the, this cycle where the automakers are saying, the reason we can't sell more cars is because you're making so much money. You are the problem. Okay? And the auto workers are saying, well, but wait a minute. You know, uh, you know, we don't have steady employment. And even if we did, even if we did have 52 weeks a year of 40 week or 40 hour a week uh, employment, we still were barely on the fringes of uh, economic uh, viability for buying a new car. Okay? And that would disappear immediately if we had like two or three kids, right? <laughs> okay, and it's the baby boom. So uh, you know, it, it was uh, um, you know really um, um, you know uh, uh, something I didn't expect to see. I thought that these auto workers would be buying uh, cars in this period. Um, I mentioned before that throughout this uh, period, uh, the the automakers themselves were reporting fabulous profits. If you looked at their numbers, you would say this is a boom. It must have translated into solid, steady work for uh, their workers. Um, it didn't, and then. Um, in many cases, you could follow the real fate of the auto industry by looking at the number of unsold cars on dealers' lots. The automakers make money as soon as the dealers buy cars from them. Then dealers are obligated to buy cars from them or else they lose their franchise. Okay? Um, and so um, if, if you follow this, um, you know, the dealers then are starting to scream, we can't take any more of your cars, okay? Uh, we're going into debt. Um, and the automakers are saying, no, you're going to take more and more. Uh, it turns out that at the end of 1955, which was the biggest boom year of the period, if you looked at the gross number of uh, cars uh, uh, produced, it's like massive, over 9 million, okay, cars and trucks. But a million of those, just about a million of those vehicles were unsold at the end of the year. They're on dealers' lots, okay? Um, you're the automaker trying to schedule production for the next year. What are you going to do? You're going to cut back, okay? And that's exactly what happened, okay? Uh, uh, it, it, it's uh, exactly what happened. For the next two years, um, you know, there was uh, um, a, a huge cutback in, uh, um, in, in production. The doldrums, it was called. When I interviewed people, I was wondering why they were laid off so much in 1956 and 1957. And then I read through here, and it's like, oh, okay. You know, now it, it, it's making more sense. Um, when um, the doldrums hit, Okay, um, the automakers and local officials, again, blame the auto workers. Okay, it's your fault. Okay, you're, 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 you're pricing cars out of the market. But they also said the problem is all these people who have moved to Detroit to work at the auto plants. All the people who moved in 1953 and in the 1955 boom and in 1950 and during the Korean War. Because uh, um, uh, what I, one thing I didn't mention is when the economy came out of the doldrums after the Korean War, the auto companies, Walter Ruther and the UAW and local officials went right straight back to all those little towns and in the big states in that big arc and said, we need you now, come back, okay? Uh, you know, we're, we're, auto industry is booming now, we need you. Uh, and that's when so many uh, hundreds of thousands did in 1953 in that boom. But in 56 and 57, and even in 54 during that recession, which I glossed over, um, as soon as times went bad, then all these local people are saying, get out, you're not an auto worker, you're not a Detroiter. You're just you know, uh, in our reserve labor force. If you would leave, our unemployment numbers would be much better. Okay? And you can't defy the logic, right? Okay? But the question is whether or not these workers coming to Detroit when times were good, when they were needed, when they were recruited, and when they could work, became Detroiters? Did they consider themselves to be auto workers? Or did they consider themselves to just be you know, part of this floating labor force that supposedly will go back to Kentucky or uh, uh, you know, northern Michigan or something when, when, when and times aren't good? And most of the workers actually thought of themselves as auto workers at that point in time. There wasn't any reason for them to go back to where they came from because there were no jobs in West Virginia or there were no jobs in, 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 in Kentucky. Um, so you know, this just kept going over and over. Um, let's see. Um, in 1955, okay, uh, um, the UAW negotiated for supplemental unemployment benefits. Okay, SUB, subpay, okay. They were going for the GAW, guaranteed annual wage, okay. And most historians look at that and say, what greedy, mm, you, know, um, you know, guaranteed annual wage. But the thinking for Walter Ruther was, okay, if the automakers are required to pay you a full year's wage if you start work in January, 
they'll figure out some way to regularize employment. We'll find some way out of this boom and bust cycle. Because even in the best of years, the auto industry tried to produce about 55 to 60 percent of their predicted sales uh, in the first three or four months of the year because they thought there was going to be some big spring selling season. Okay, so there was unemployment built in, if you can understand that. It means that in the last you know, seven or eight months of the year, um, you're only going to have about 40 percent uh, of the total year's uh, you know, production come out of, of, the, of these plants. Um, and so um, when the spring selling season always failed to materialize, the automakers are getting confused. It's like, well, maybe it'll come in the fall. Maybe it'll come next year, okay? Um, but uh, um, uh, there was this unemployment built in, and the UAW was arguing that, whoa, why don't we produce cars at a more regular pace throughout the year, having steady employment, and uh, that'll solve problems. But a lot of people said that looks like socialism, that looks like some kind of crazy intervention in the economy. If you can guarantee us customers, we'll guarantee you a wage. So they compromised and got supplemental unemployment benefits. And what that basically meant is like a doubling of unemployment pay. Okay? Um, and so a lot of uh, people at the time and scholars since said, well, then the security problem is solved. Layoffs no longer were a factor for auto workers. They had supplemental unemployment pay. Okay? But the supplemental unemployment pay was not all that great. You know, it amounted to about 60% of your pay under this new system. But there were also a, a lot of problems in that the fund had to take time to grow. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't completely funded for several years. And if you remember what we just talked about, 1956 and 57 were terrible years. A lot of people were unemployed. But you had to be uh, employed, uh, I th believe it was like in March 1956 to qualify for anything, but everyone seemed to be unemployed. The point I'm getting is that eligibility requirements were strict, the fund was low, and throughout the 1950s, people were claiming their supplemental unemployment pay of like $6 a week or $2 a week or something. It was, it was a laughable amount. Uh, you know, eventually, by the late 60s into the 70s, when these funds were actually fully funded, then auto workers were sometimes getting 95% of their take-home pay. Uh, when they were unemployed, but that was not the case in the 1950s. And even skilled workers, the elite of the elite, uh, were having a hard time. Wage compression was bothering them. Uh, they had gone through their four-year apprenticeships. They had their cars. They had sacrificed so much to, to get their skilled workers' credentials. But most of the wage increases that the UAW negotiated for went to the unskilled, went to the semi-skilled, went to the non-skilled workers. And so the compression was, uh, uh, was causing that wage gap to narrow. And uh, um, by the late 1957, two-thirds of skilled workers in Detroit were also unemployed. When the factory shut down, a lot of the skilled workers who were involved with repairing machinery weren't busy because the machinery wasn't being used. And a lot of skilled work was being outsourced to Great Britain and Germany and places like that, believe it or not. Okay? Um, so 1956 and 1957 were the peak years for the U.S. economy in the decade. Each year, there'd be headlines saying, greatest year ever, the next greatest year ever. Okay. Um, and aggregate economic data you know, uh, um, seemed to indicate that. But unemployment in Detroit throughout these years was consistently over 100,000, 7% total, but usually at least double that because it was heavily concentrated in, amongst industrial workers. Um, whereas uh, 1957 was considered the best year ever, in 1957, according to the Michigan Employment Security Mission in Detroit, Detroit was marked, quote, by continuing serious unemployment, high payment of jobless benefits, and concurrent reduction of manufacturing employment to the lowest point since 1949. And that's the discrepancy I'm trying to look at. If you look at the national economy, it's booming. And our understanding of the booming national economy is that it was because of the auto industry. And it is still largely true. The auto industry was prospering, just not auto workers. <laughs> OK? Uh, and, you know, it seems counterfactual. It seems counterintuitive, uh, but again, you know, the profitability of the industry was not dependent upon full employment. Um, GM set the pricing really for the industry because it was by far the biggest corporation, and they arranged production so that they could be guaranteed their target profit operating at about 60% of capacity. So if they uh, you know, ended up having a, a, a bad year with lots of uh, unemployment, they would still hit their, uh, uh, their, their, their profit goals, and it could be better than that too. Okay. Um, but throughout these years, 56, 57, um, and then in 58, which is a terrible recession year in Detroit, just a terrible recession year in Detroit, um, auto workers were hit doubly hard in a way because they thought 1955 was for real. They're making steady money throughout the first half of the year. Uh, the boom has finally arrived, a long fuse. It's 10 years after the war, but the boom is here. We're making money. What are you going to do if you make more money? 
Some people are going to say, save it, right? But a whole lot of people are saying, spend it. And actually, business leaders, economists, pundits around the country are saying, come out, auto workers, spend your money. That's what America is about. If you don't spend, the economy is going to sputter, okay? It's up to you. And so the auto workers would uh, maybe venture in, into homeowning territory, maybe get a bigger apartment. You're going to buy a refrigerator. You're going to maybe buy a car. You're going to do all these things. 56 and 57 hit, and you're laid off frequently. 58. Uh, in 1958, a lot of auto workers were laid off for the whole year, sometimes you know, only eight or nine months. But what happens to your refrigerator? What happens to your new apartment? What happens to these things? Um, you know, repossessions, uh, oh, and you get court information in, in newspapers and you just see auto worker after auto worker coming in, losing their stuff. An awful lot of Southerners who had moved up north just left, just left their stuff. They knew it was going to be repossessed anyway. Uh, um, the population of Harlan County, Kentucky went up by about 30,000 in 1958, and it was almost all auto workers from Detroit and Flint. They're laid off, and their family members and you know former uh, residents are kind of happy to see them, you know, but have nothing for them to do. And 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 uh, um, you know they were living in tobacco shacks and stuff like that. So um, you know this was just staggering, you know, to read. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, the 58 recession in great detail because it just seems like piling on, but uh, unemployment was consistently over 250,000 in the city that stayed that way for uh, well over a year. Uh, the doldrums lasted into the late 1959. The only chance you had in late 1959, early 1960 of having steady employment was if you worked um, um, on one of these um, um, production lines, supply chains, or uh, assembly uh, for uh, new fuel efficient cars. Um, the Corvair, the Ford Falcon, the Dodge Dart. It turns out that Americans wanted small, fuel-efficient cars. Okay, but the problem in 1958, 59, and 60 was the same as it is today. The auto companies couldn't produce those profitably. It takes about the same amount of engineering uh, costs, tool and die costs, all of the infrastructure to build a car, and the materials are about the same whether it's you know a, 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 a tiny compact car or a big Cadillac. But the profit margin comes with the bigger cars. And so, uh, you know, it was, it was untenable even in the 1950s, and that's why, uh, um, you know, it, it's been consistently hard. I think I have one of the last Ford Focus, you know, cars that was made in Wayne, Michigan, you know. Um, but, um, you know, that, 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 that small car production is gone. Um, so anyways, uh, you know, just to, uh, uh, you, you get the point. Um, uh, you know, I can't explain exactly how we've come to believe that these were the golden years. But as I read through the newspapers, it was kind of like when you're watching a bad B movie, and they say, "I think things now are going to be perfectly fine," and then the monster jumps out of the lake or you know out of the cave or something like that. You know, uh, uh, the Martians attack. You know, uh, um, and, and it was like every day, like, "Oh man," you know. Uh, um, uh, but I want to insist that for, to the people I interviewed, these were not necessarily terrible times. Uh, most of the people I talked to were very. Um, reflective on this, they, they, they thought that they didn't want to go back to those days, but on the other hand, they didn't realize that it was their mission to be living through a golden age. <laughs> when, they were, when they were living through it, they were raising kids, they were struggling, um, and they felt really proud of themselves for having made it through these difficult times and for having emerged on the other side with greater stability, because I did locate these people at retiree luncheons, so they stayed in the industry. They weren't ones who were jettisoned out, okay, uh, you know, throughout these years. Um, and so uh, it's not like to the people living through this, it was always gloom and doom and despair, but it was hard. And people had to really scrap and scrape to make, uh, 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 um, you know, to make things work. And um, I think that's the biggest message I have for, uh, uh, in, in a sense is that, um, uh, you know, for instance, labor historians said that these workers were you know, apathetic and just um, satiated with their, their, their splendor and all their goods. And I, I think they were just too busy just uh, too busy trying to get by, doing all these other jobs, trying to get back in the auto industry, trying to balance relationships, family obligations, and not always succeeding at it. Uh, and, and I think that if you get down to the level of human beings, everything looks a lot different than, than it does from the level of, uh, um, of institutions and the macroeconomic data. Um, I do think that historians have read history backwards, that auto workers eventually could afford a cottage up north maybe, or a new car and all this kind of stuff, so therefore they might have always been able to. Um, I think we always want to have some kind of golden age we can point to, to say, oh, that's when things were better, things have only gotten worse since or something. Um, I don't know for sure, but, um, but that's the, the, the gist of the book, uh, and, and I appreciate your patience. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, too. Um.